on the side there, married uh, is a little bit higher than living alone. There are more married men than women. Uh, there are more women living alone than men. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to why that is? Men die younger. Yeah, we die first. Yep, that's true. <laughs> it catches up to all of us in the end, right? <clears throat> That took a morbid turn. Uh, so, <laughs> older adults in alcohol. So we broke down who lives alone, who's married. What we see with more frequent drinking is this is, a, this is associated with being married, not living alone, having a much larger social network. So getting wrapped up in that, having a few drinks with your friends, being around people who are drinking. This is going to encourage people to drink much more frequently. Uh, so pre frequent participation in activities in and out of the home. There's a little bit of a social lubricant, potentially. So individuals who are doing group activities, either at home, outside of the home, uh, having dinner, having an extra glass of wine, these are all things that are associated with more frequent drinking in older adults. However, if we take a look at higher volume drinking, we see this happens with lower family satisfaction, depression, higher perceived stressfulness in life, a lower sense of coherence, not being married, and living alone. So if we're comparing those two, Again, we see more frequent drinking. So if somebody's having that moderately risky level of drinking, that may be happening more frequently. And we would tailor our assessment and our screening and our treatment to talking about the lifestyle choices and kind of the social perspective about when is it OK to have a drink? What is the impact of just one or two drinks? Versus as an individual who's drinking at higher volumes, you certainly see the potential for comorbidity, depression, lower life satisfaction the impairment on the psychological functioning as well. So with higher volume drinking, you're going to get those impaired health outcomes. It also seems that there's a correlation between that and psychological functioning. So that's something that we want to be clued into as we're screening and as we're assessing older adults. Older women specifically, so they're more likely to have alcohol problems, specifically when they have had a problem drinking spouse. So an individual who is drinking, uh, a spouse who is drinking, that's going to kind of carry over to the individual, the older woman. She's also going to have difficulties with alcohol. An individual who has lost a companion, a widowed older woman, uh, will, have, will be more likely to have alcohol problems. She'll be more likely to experience depression. Again, that comorbidity. Alcohol is coping. Alcohol that's exacerbating underlying depression. <clears throat> and then certainly, injury is due to falls, because we know the effect of alcohol. You drink alcohol, you're going to slur your speech, you're going to have lowered inhibitions, but it also affects your motor functioning, uh, your coordination, more likely to fall over and get injured. <clears throat> and then those individuals who self-medicate, of course we understand, are much more likely to identify uh, lower life satisfaction, more loneliness. Again, the alcohol may be contributing to that and exacerbating underlying symptoms, or it may be a means of self-medicating or trying to cope with that feeling of loneliness and isolation. We also know that individuals who use later are going to experience much more lasting damage. So neurologically, on this brain scan, blue is bad. So blue indicates areas where there's reduced functioning uh, due to chronic alcoholism. And you tend to see it more in the frontal lobe, which is responsible for some of that decision making, that executive functioning uh, inhibition. So decisions such as, maybe I shouldn't have a drink today. I'm feeling down. My counselor told me to use these specific coping skills, told me to go to this group, told me to engage in appropriate social functions. That's going to be impaired, that decision making, that higher level functioning. So if we're saying, use these good coping skills, use these good resources, this individual may be much more inclined to just go to the bottle, just have a drink to feel better, rather than trying to engage in all these wonderful skills and suggestions and recommendations that we typically give them. We know this, this is much more significantly impairing for individuals who are 50 and older uh, than individuals who are younger than that. That's a very specific cutoff for experiencing the detrimental effects of chronic alcoholism. Some of the medical concerns. Heavy drinking, again, really associated with an increased risk of injuries due to falls. <clears throat> it's a leading risk factor in development of specific cancers cancers of the mouth, neck, and head, as well as coronary artery disease and strokes. Uh, this heart disease, cancer, stroke, these are the three leading causes of death among individuals 65 and older. And we know that alcohol can significantly contribute to these. The take-home point here is that later life acute and chronic illnesses, 
these things that are leading to death in the 65 and older population, these can be managed through lifestyle alterations. There's a very clear antecedent. There's a very clear behavior that leads up to the development of some of these cancers, some of these illnesses. If we can cut down, if we can help the individual reduce some of their drinking, they might be at a lowered risk of developing these three leading causes of death. And those are all very specific behavioral interventions that we can deliver. Jim's going to get into that towards the end. But we know that we're not playing with chance here. We know that we can identify a very specific risk behavior and intervene on that. Some of the other interactions, there's an increased or decreased drug metabolism depending on what the individual is prescribed. Again, if you're looking at heart disease, um, a risk of stroke and trying to reduce that. There's an interference with the effectiveness of drugs. So an individual who is prescribed a whole host of drugs for managing hypertension, uh, depression, if they're having insomnia, alcohol can make all of these things not as effective. It can actually make insomnia worse. The individual who is having trouble sleeping and just needs a drink or two or three, depending on how much they're pouring, to get to sleep at night, we know that's not actually going to help their insomnia. <clears throat> Go ahead. There's also an exacerbation of specific side effects. Uh, with nitrates, you get hypotension. Uh, sedation is really important to consider as well, narcotics and other sedatives, because then you get kind of this compounding stacking effect with the alcohol, and that can be uh, really detrimental to the individual, could lead to death. GI bleeding with NSAIDs or aspirins. <clears throat> alcohol can contribute to specific gastrointestinal bleeding as well. So it's not just the alcohol and the effect that the alcohol has on the individual. It's in combination with psychological functioning. It's in combination with medical functioning. And we know that if an individual has a substance use disorder, a psychological illness, or a medical illness, they're at risk of developing one of whatever they don't have as well. So again, there's this compounding stacking effect uh, from use. There's also one slide that we skipped that I noticed a couple of you noticed. Um, it's general information about thing, conditions that alcohol makes worse, but it's true across the populations. It's not specific to older adults. So it's embedded in your slide set. We hit it so you have the information. You can get all these slides later if it's hard for you to read that little tiny print as well. So we'll make sure you have the slides in, in uh, PowerPoint form. Thanks, Tom. Specifically to individuals who are living with HIV or AIDS, uh, about 50% of these individuals have lifetime alcohol use disorder. You saw that slide in the co-occurrence of lifetime alcohol use disorder and non-alcohol substance use disorder. About 8% report current heavy drinking, and this is about double the general, the general population rate. So in this population specifically, alcohol is going to be much more of a concern. We know that they're using it much higher rates than the general population, and there are associations with poor mental health functioning, increased odds of suicide, increased risk of accidental or recurrent falls, and then increased mortality. So all of the outcomes are bad. We know that individuals who uh, are living with HIV or AIDS are going to be much more likely to drink, and then they're going to be much more likely to experience injury, falls, other health risks, uh, including psychological impairment, uh, risk of suicide, and then the potential for increased mortality as a whole. I'm going to switch it over to Jim now. He'll talk about some of the specific medication interactions between drugs and alcohol. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. Is this on? Can you guys hear me? All right, I'm seeing some heads nodding, so I'm assuming yes, right? OK. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, just alcohol interactions with uh, antiretroviral meds. We'll talk a little bit about prescription drugs, and then a little bit about marijuana, and then we'll take a, a break to give you guys a chance to stretch your legs. So obviously important topic to look at is how do alcohol and, and drugs uh, interact with HIV medication. So alcohol and most of the illicit drugs are metabolized by the same liver enzymes as many HIV medications, the cytochrome P450 system, which can lead to significant interactions between them. So if they're all metabolized by the same enzymes, um, that can lead to some significant issues, which we'll talk about in a minute. Other medications like Combivir or Truvada are metabolized by different liver enzymes, and so they're less vulnerable to interactions with uh, psychotropic medications or alcohol and drugs. So obviously this has significance for both ongoing treatment as well as PEP and PrEP. So if you've got somebody on PrEP taking Truvada, probably a little bit less risky in terms of interacting with drugs and alcohol, but how, how might we want to present that to
<laughs> but what was that? Exactly. Yeah. So, okay, we're, you want to be on prep? Great. Put you on Travada. You can drink as much as you want. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we probably don't want to give that message, right? Good for us to know that there's less risk involved, but we obviously want to still warn patients that there, there is a chance of uh, interactions with alcohol and drugs. There's also more of a chance that they'll forget to <coughs> take their medicine yeah. if they're on alcohol as well, which obviously yeah, which will, it's true of alcohol and most drugs. Some interesting recent findings with regard to marijuana, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. So if we look at, uh, this is a very recently published study looking at simian immunodeficiency disease. Rhesus monkeys, I know there are a lot of strong feelings uh, in either direction on use of animals in research, and, and I share some of those feelings. But I think probably the, the best way that we can honor those animals is to make use of the information that they gave us. So looking at that, we actually see some really significant effects of chronic drinking um, with SIV or HIV. It tends to accelerate progression to end-stage disease, increases viral load levels in the lungs during bacterial infections, reduces skeletal muscle capacity, in other words, uh, muscles attached to our skeleton, which we use to move voluntarily, increases viral load in, in CSF cerebrospinal fluid. So we probably are not, not going to be looking for increases in viral load in, in the brain. That's probably not going to be helpful, right? Which is probably why it tends to uh, increase cognitive impairment and neurobehavioral deficits. And it accentuates wasting uh, at end stage disease. So if we transfer these to human beings and assume that they're, it's going to have like uh, alcohol, chronic, somebody who's a chronic drinker, is going to have similar effects as this. Obviously, some, some really serious effects of chronic drinking. OK, looking at prescription drugs for a minute. As Tom mentioned earlier, unfortunately, in a lot of this work, it's hard to find information that's broken down by ethnicity. Um, so we're working with what we can here. So a couple of interesting things here. If you look at people uh, 50 and over, not necessarily HIV positive, but just 50 and over population, we see. White folks, you, no, that doesn't. Oh, OK. Can you guys see that or no? Somebody said yes? OK. Um, we'll just do it this way then. So if we look at pain relievers, tranquilizers, sedatives, and illicit drugs, we see some interesting breakdowns. Um, so with pain use of, oops, use of pain relievers, 78% of them tended to be white if we look at this particular sample. 10% uh, African American, almost 10% Hispanic. And then if you look at male and female, pretty even breakdown between men and women. If we look at tranquilizers, which are things like benzos, um, we see, again, it's the white folks uh, using uh, a lot of those. Little bit of use by African Americans. Again, about 10% by Hispanics. Um, and breakdown by men and women is a little bit different. It tends to be more of a 60-40 split, more in terms of women, um, fewer in terms of men. But that's still not a huge difference. Sedatives, uh, like things like uh, Ambien, Lunesta, and some of the neuroleptics that are used for, for sedatives, like using uh, Seroquel off-label for sleep, which is not uncommon, right? We look at those. Again, white folks using most of those, but uh, and black folks really not using them at all. Hispanics, 28.8%. So that's kind of an interesting difference in terms of Latino folks. Not really sure what explains that, um, but in terms of using, more, using those more so than they use pain relievers or sedatives, pain relievers or tranquilizers. And then really pronounced difference in terms of gender with this one. So 75% women and 25% men. Sure. I'm sorry, say that again? Yes, I do think that that is, is part of the, the, the issue. I don't know that they looked at this in the, the National uh, Survey on Drug Use and Health, but I suspect that socioeconomic status and, and access to health care has a lot to do with this. And then illicit drugs or illegal drugs, uh, again, white folks 
79 percent, uh, black about 10 percent, Hispanic about seven and a half, um, and back to more of an even split between men and women. So just a little bit of a breakdown to give us some sense of in the 50 and over crowd, what does this tend to look like by ethnicity? Um, that even split is uh, different for older adults than it is for others. If you look at drug use in general in the, in the uh, adult population, not the older adult population. It's about two-thirds male, one-third female across all drugs of abuse. Here, it's a closer to 50-50 with a slight preponderance of, of uh, women using illicit drugs. And so we see an equalization of drug use behavior as people age and continue those behaviors. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Prescription drug abuse in older adults. Two out of five uh, patients report taking five or more prescription medications. Right? So if we look at just a, a population of folks, 55, 60, 65, 70, we know they're often taking a lot of medication. Right? In general, older adults are using prescription meds uh, three times more than the general population of folks younger than them. On average, they're taking four and a half, whoops, keep doing that, four and a half medications per day. And nationally, about almost three million people uh, in terms of older adults are abusing prescription drugs in the past year. So that's kind of a, a big number of people. California's percentage was a little bit lower, but still over 800,000 people in the state of California over the age of 50 um, abusing prescription drugs. And I th as Tom said earlier, I think we're only going to see these numbers continue to, to increase. If we look at emergency room visits, uh, huge huge increase in five years. So between 2004 and 2009, emergency room visits for people 50 and over re related to prescription drugs almost tripled from 150,000 in uh, 2004 to, to over 300,000 in, in, uh, 300, in 2009. That's a huge increase for a five-year period. And again, we, we were probably going to see that continuing. Almost half of those were for people over 60. So again, if we look at, and I'm going to show you some, some things uh, a little bit later where we parse out folks between 50 and 59 and then 60 and over. So because there are some differences um, as one of the slides that uh, Andrew or, or Tom looked at in terms of the baby boomers and how they regard the use of medications or drugs. Still uh, can be lethal. Combining uh, prescription and over-the-counter medications. Again, this is general information in terms of combining medications, uh, particularly for people 50 and over, um, but, he, but younger than that, that as well. I mean, we, we, we all remember cases like Heath Ledger and Corey Monteith found dead in hotel rooms with bags of heroin uh, and bottles of Vicodin and some bottles of vodka or whiskey, right? So most people still really don't understand the extent to which if you combine a lot of these medications with alcohol, that you're, you're developing a lethal combination. Antiretrovirals and drugs, as opposed to alcohol, we looked at a couple of minutes ago. So metabolism of, of uh, amphetamines, ecstasy, ketamine, and methadone can be inhibited by protease inhibitors leading to overdose. So if they're not being metabolized as fast, more is build, building up in the body and bloodstream, and that can lead to toxicity. Opioids, it's, it goes either way. Can either be increased or reduced metabolism uh, from, from the PIs. So you might end up with symptoms of either opioid withdrawal or toxicity and overdose. And so People taking PIs and prescription painkillers, Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycodone, um, what have you, may experience a loss of pain relieving effects. So if it's being metabolized uh, faster than ordinarily would be, then you've got less in the system to provide pain relief. If in the other direction, not being metabolized fast enough, then you're going to see uh, symptoms of sedation. Um, you guys are probably all familiar with the, the nodding syndrome with, with uh, heroin users, right? So. We'll see, oftentimes you see, I'm seeing somebody nodding their head no. So uh, oftentimes with heroin users, we'll see them, uh, if you have them in their office, they're just kind of nodding off. They're kind of sleepy, uh, often hard to maintain consciousness. So with something like this, if they're taking a PI uh, and using a prescription opioid painkiller, you may see more of that. It may be harder for them to stay awake and alert. 
in which case you'd want to refer them back to the prescribing physician for an evaluation of their dose because their, their dose for some reason is too high. Yeah, exactly. So marijuana. We could spend all morning just talking about marijuana, right? A um, lot of aspects of, of marijuana um, and strong feelings in either way. We're not necessarily going to take a position on any of those, but what we did want to do is kind of present uh, at least two sides of, of the argument in terms of marijuana. So a lot of reasons for caution with marijuana just in general these days. Um, we're seeing people more and more exhibiting signs of dependence on marijuana and withdrawal symptoms when they've been using regularly and then stop using. Anybody have any sense of, we never used to see that with marijuana. Anybody have any sense of why now in recent years we're seeing more of that? Yeah. Yep, exactly. And then behind you? Yeah. Exactly. How many of you who work in substance abuse treatment settings or mental health treatment settings have people come in and say, well, I know I need to quit using heroin or meth, but you don't expect me to stop smoking marijuana, right? Because I got my prescription card here. Right? That can make treatment kind of fun. The other and, aspect... And there are good reasons to, not to. It, Actually, the, there are reasons truly that marijuana does help medically. Uh, and so the controversy becomes, what do you do in that case when someone is in recovery, they're dealing with these issues, and yet marijuana is the only thing that continues their appetite in, given the side effects of the medications that they're on. It's really so, complicated. Right, so it's the opposite side of the issue. But getting back to what you said, um, the THC content, THC's active ingredient, or one of the most active ingredients in marijuana, THC content in what's available now, as you said, due to crossbreeding and genetics, THC content compared to what was available 20 or 30 years ago has skyrocketed. So if you've got a much, much greater degree of THC, that becomes more addictive. Yeah, something like 15 times as much THC over, over 10 years. That's incredibly high. Um, and so if you, we are seeing people exhibiting signs of becoming dependent on marijuana and having a harder time getting off of it. Um, so, okay, so obviously we've been saying people with HIV are living longer these days. Somebody receiving a diagnosis back in the, in the late 80s to mid 90s, they weren't thinking about living into their 50s and 60s, right? It was a short-term issue. Um, a, lot of, a lot of folks said, well, I'm gonna be dead in a few years anyway, so I might as well blow my life savings uh, and go out and party, right? Very different. After the mid-90s with the advent of the protease inhibitors, now people start living longer. We see people who now who've been living with the disease for 20, 25 years. So many of whom may have thought back when they were diagnosed that they didn't have much time left. So they didn't really plan. What, what do I want my career to look like? What do I want retirement to look like? Um, they haven't considered those things. So now we're seeing a lot more of those issues as it's become regarded as a, more of a chronic disease that can be managed. One, one issue with that is the younger folks. So that the 13 to 19 age group and, and the young adults, they unfortunately, well fortunately and unfortunately, didn't live through the same time periods that many of us did and see the devastation caused by HIV. And so for many of them, it's like, eh, well, you know, it's a chronic disease like diabetes or something. You take medication for the rest of your life and it's no big deal. Um, that We've heard that expressed uh, by young folks in terms of uh, their attitudes towards HIV. So that's, that's a little bit disconcerting. Um, so these days, people with HIV should be just as concerned about their long-term health as everybody else does. And dependence, if you actually become dependent on marijuana, that poses significant both physical and mental, uh, mental health risks, whether or not you have HIV. So cognitive impairment. Um, in advanced disease, disease stage, we have, um, I'm sure you're all familiar, familiar with the term HIV-associated neurocognitive disorders, or HAND. Symptoms are confusion, forgetfulness, headaches. Any of that sound familiar to people who are using marijuana? So three main types of, of, of HAND. 
asymptomatic, which means basically there is some cognitive impairment, but they're not subjectively aware of it. And so they're able to function pretty much normally. Mild neuro neurocognitive disorder, impaired cognitive ability, and it is beginning to uh, in inter interfere with activities of daily living. And then more of a severe uh, dementia kind of condition where they are experiencing major impairments in, in cognition and daily functioning. So that's just from the HIV. So then if you add in some of the cognitive effects of long-term marijuana use, you're, you're probably going to get an additive effect of those things. We know long-term marijuana use impairs learning and memory. Um, how many, anybody ever had a, a client or, or a patient come in and say, God, you know, I, I was you know, smoking some weed last night with a group of friends. Man, we had this really intense conversation. We like figured out all these things, all the answers, solutions to all these problems in the world. Unfortunately, this morning we can't remember what they were. Anybody ever heard stories like that? Um, so blurring in memory, um, again, cognitive impairment as well as effects of the marijuana. About half of HIV positive marijuana users report memory problems. Um, cognitive effects are particularly strong for people experiencing HAND. So as I said, there's probably an additive effect between the effects of, of marijuana and of HIV associated cognitive issues. Medication adherence is something that we're going to be talking about um, repeatedly today, um, both for its own sake and because a lot of the factors that we're talking about in terms of alcohol and drug use and mental health issues tend to interfere with medication adherence, right? Um, forgetting to take medication is the leading cause of non-adherence. So again, if you're, you've got somebody who's using marijuana on a regular basis, that tendency toward forgetfulness may very well interfere with medication adherence. Use of most recreational drugs and alcohol is associated with poor uh, medication adherence, less suppression of, of the virus, and slower CD4 cell response rate. So again, we want to, I th think we have this a little bit later, but uh, you know, we need, as you guys I'm sure all, all know, we need a, to achieve a 90 to 95 percent medication adherence rate, right, to fully suppress replication of the virus. So, some of us have worked in the area of, of methamphetamine users uh, for many years. And so we certainly see that with methamphetamine use, there is a, a strong correlation with reduced medication adherence. So if you guys will go out and, you know, on a week-long meth binge and not take their meds during that time. What, what often tends to happen or what are we afraid might happen in those experiences? Yeah, exactly. So the virus has an opportunity to replicate and maybe develop resistance to the type of medication that they're taking, right? Obviously not a good thing. Okay, now having said all of that in terms of caution with marijuana, let me pre present the other side. There's some, a couple of interesting studies just published in the last few months that provide some, some food for thought. So one of those, um, in, and most studies so far have not identified long-term negative effects of regular cannabis use on the progression of the disease. So these two studies recently published, recently diagnosed folks um, reporting daily cannabis use had significantly lower viral loads a year after diagnosis than people reporting no marijuana use or light marijuana use. That's kind of an interesting finding, right? Kind of like makes you sort of scratch your head. Um, why would that be the case? No idea. So this is one of the, as I said, just published in the last few months. We don't want to necessarily draw any conclusions based on one study. It'll be interesting to see if these findings are replicated in other studies. The other interesting finding, they looked at five, over 500 uh, positive illicit drug users, median age of 45, which is approaching the, the age range that we're looking at. They found no difference in medication adherence rates between folks saying that they use cannabis every day and folks saying they don't use cannabis at all or just a little bit. So that's really surprising uh, because, as I said, we've known for many years that with alcohol and just about every other drug, there absolutely is a decrease in medication adherence. So this finding that uh, regular marijuana users did not have that is really, it's very interesting. It kind of flies in the face of, of accepted wisdom. So this one, too, uh, in, in this study, they looked at alcohol and heroin and cocaine and crack. They all were associated with reduced medication adherence. So same thing with this. We're not going to draw any conclusions based on one study, but it's an interesting finding, and it will be interesting to see if it can be replicated in other studies. 
it also is a potential reason why we may we don't need to panic if we find out someone is using marijuana for medical reasons. Uh, it's probably not, at least if these studies hold true, impacting their viral load overall, and it's probably not impacting their adherence to their other medicines. Um, this is particularly important given that the likelihood is everyone that I know who's, who's sort of prognosticating politics of marijuana going the way that Colorado did here in Colorado, or here in California in 2016. Um, so we're likely to have full legalization, including for recreational use, which is going to change the face of our treatment system tremendously. So this kind of data becomes really important. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Mm, the hallucinogenic parts. Yeah, if it works. And, and you know, one of the interesting things is that and as people have, uh, what's the, Marinol, the prescription version? Yeah. Um, like with Marinol, you know, we, they, they extracted certain aspects of marijuana, put it in a pill form as a medication, you can take that. A lot of the studies that, that we've seen have indicated that that does not have the same efficacy as smoking or ingesting the plant. So it'll be interesting to see as we go forward, as Tom said, with Colorado, Washington State now, you can just walk into a dispensary and buy without even a prescription. So as we have more and more of that uh, going down the road, we're obviously going to see more studies over the next few years taking a look at this. We do have a full slide set uh, in this series on the AETC website on medical marijuana. There's lots of really good information on that.